you shall open your hand wide to him, and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. That's from today's reading from Deuteronomy. From the psalm, a good man deals graciously and leans. He regards his affairs with discretion. And Paul to the Corinthian church. Last year you were the first to give. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. You know, a, a very cursory, selective reading of the Old Testament Psalm and Epistle this morning kind of sounds like a, a Dave Ramsey financial talk on the radio. Seems to be telling us how we are to lend, raise, and handle the bank. This is why a verse here, a verse there, in isolation, can send us down the wrong path. The full study, contextual reading of these three passages will show that. They're not telling us how we should handle money. They're telling us how we should handle our heart. Every seventh year under the political rules and regulations we were on. The year the land would be given what's called a year of release. Just you couldn't plant, you couldn't harvest, you couldn't plow. You could eat whatever voluntarily just grew up, anyone good. But not only the land got a rest, in those days if somebody owed you money and for whatever reason they fell upon hard times and couldn't pay you back, then they would work it off and serve to you until the year of release. At which time their servitude would be notified and so would their debt. Today's Deuteronomy reading is telling us that no matter that someone owes you money, no matter that they may be working at all, it doesn't matter that the year of release is coming up, at which time they won't owe you anymore, nor will they have to work at all. You still help this person. I mean, the immediate reaction would be, I'm going to help this. This guy, he already would be money, but he can pay that back. And then next year, he wouldn't have to work at all or pay it back. Why should I have to? This passage is telling us that is not the attitude to have. It's telling us that notwithstanding anything else, your heart should surely want to help your brother or sister, regardless of the situation. Paul and Titus in today's epistle are got a, a money raising campaign going on. They're raising money for the church of Jerusalem. And Paul's writing to the Corinthian church expressing how impressed he is with the churches in Macedonia. How encouraged he is. Not by how much money they have raised, but how in their abject heart they joyfully contribute. This is the time of a universal problem. It wasn't just the churches that were, that were poor and shrugged. J.W. Garvey in his book, The Second Epistle to the Corinthians, points out how, how war, continuous war, had just ravaged the area. Macedonia had been reduced to just poverty we can't imagine. So bad that actually the uh, Roman Emperor, Tiberius Caesar, reduced the taxes on, on Macedonia. When, when the Roman Emperor lowers your taxes, things are very, very bad. Paul was just impressed that the Macedonian churches gave when they had nothing. But he's even more impressed that they had hearts that wanted to give when they had nothing. These readings are not about how much we should give, but about what kind of hearts we should have. 
It's a message reinforced by today's gospel. I didn't research this, so I maybe shouldn't say this, but this may be the only lectionary reading that has that covers two distinct and separate and seemingly unconnected miracles. And Jesus is on the way to heal Jairus' little daughter. For this woman, a very serious chronic bleeding brother, she slips up behind Jesus and touches his garment. And she was healed. Jesus then goes to Jairus' house, where by this time, due to the interruption by this lady speaking here, the daughter has died. And he goes on and raises her, as we heard in the gospel. The only connection between these two miracles seems to be how unconnected are the two recipients in their social standing in the social life. Jairus was a weaver about that. He was a powerful man. Mark describes him as a ruler of the synagogue. And the Greek word there for ruler is archisynagogue. Arch, we still use the word arch as an archbishop. It, 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 it signals very high authority. Our archbishop Foley is the highest single spiritual authority in the church. Person. So that he uses arch synagogue to describe this man and tells us that this man wields an authority to a high ranking Jewish fellow. Probably his job to proclaim and pronounce the Judaic belief and law of that day, which most of which was probably in opposition to Jesus. For this man to come and fall, publicly fall, at Jesus' feet and ask Jesus to heal his daughter is in essence this man acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of God. Messiah. Not a very good career move for an Archie Senegal. But when your child is near death, the heart is able to see things it would never have considered before. Jesus is not interested in how we handle money, or power, or authority. Only how we handle our hearts. Because if our hearts are right, all needed resources will come. The heart of Jesus did not deny Jairus because he was on the other side of the Jesus Jewish divide. The heart of Jesus didn't see an adversary. But only the heart of a man full of pain and need. Blessed are the poor in spirit does not assume that all who are poor in spirit are also poor in earthly treasure. Elvis Preston, Robin Williams, Jimmy Wolf, Ernest Hemingway, George Eastman, Kurt Cobain, we can go on. All rich, all wielding great influence. Fought by the world to have the world at their fingertips. And obviously, they had deep wounds of the heart, soul, and mind, many of which so bad they ended their own life. Charity moves from those who have to those who are lacking. We should never think that we can be of no help to those who are blessed with vast earthly resources. Because if your heart is full of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and theirs is broken and tortured and empty, then your heart holds what theirs long for. Shed. God is only interested in how we handle it. There is held in isolation in Jewish society. Probably, probably well. And 
And he had probably been prior to this moment in opposition to Jesus. The heart of Jesus saw through all that. And Jesus' heart connected with the need in Jairus' heart. Jesus then encounters this woman who was on the other opposite end of the social ladder from Jairus. This lady had been bleeding for 12 years. And according to the biblical law, she was unclean, ceremonially unclean. Worst kind of unclean you could be in Judaism and in that night. No one could hug her. No one could even touch her. And if someone did, they had to go home and bathe and change their clothes. Anything she touched could never be touched by others. She was a total outcast according to the Jewish law. For 12 years. And that is in addition to the pain and discomfort of her illness. Not to mention, she is now completely penniless, dead broke, having spent all on doctors trying to find a cure. This woman had a heart full of need. She came forth, slipped up behind Jesus, probably because she was not allowed to be seen or be out. She slips up behind Jesus and touches his garment, and Jesus said, Who touched me? And he's gone, as though he didn't know. Of course he did. And he called her out. Who touched me? This lady comes forward. All on her face and poured out her heart to Jesus about her desperate situation. And Jesus didn't care. Jesus didn't care that she was unclean. Jesus didn't care that she was supposed to be an outcast. Jesus didn't care that he wasn't supposed to engage this lady. And Jesus didn't care that she was broken and could offer him nothing in return. Heart of Jesus connected with the need and the faith in her heart, and he healed her on the spot. He called her out, I believe. He could have just kept walking. Somebody touched him. Who was it? Already knowing who it was. But I think he called her out so she could come forth and proclaim for all to see what the Lord have done for her. May our hearts do the same. Then Jesus heads on to Jerry's house. And they tell him, the little girl's dead. Why bother us in here? But he knew the pain in Jerry's heart. And Jesus decided he would not make this raising her from the dead some kind of carnal spectacle magic show, so he only allowed the mom and dad and the three disciples, Peter, John, and James, coming with him. He goes into his room, he says, little girl, I say, arise. And she got up and walked. She was 12 years old. And we hope and pray that she lived a long, long life. Good life. We'll never know. But we do know she died in the beginning. We hope this lady, the issue of blood, was healed. We don't know, but we hope she lived a long, good life. But she did die then. You know, the progress of medicine is astounding. Me standing here is evidence of that. I had two far people bypass open heart surgeries over 15, 16 years. I had Prostate cancer, and I stand here feeling good. It's mind boggling what doctors and surgeons can do. But they are limited in their fight against sickness and death. Our Lord is not 
Atlanta did against either. But we are. And we are given a span of years here in this life. The longest of which is going to be short. And over those years that we are given, our measure will be taken by God. Not of how we handle our money or power. How we handle our heart. How then should we handle our heart? Well, it's a strange thing. If our hearts are full of Jesus, and our hearts are full of the Holy Spirit, the only way we can keep it full is to give it 